Hello and thanks for listening. The following is the audio version of the book, You Must Be Born Again. Both a printed version and ebook version are available. To request either one free of charge, contact me at the email address listed here. There are additional footnotes and references included in the printed and ebook versions, so it may be worth your while if this topic interests you. This audiobook is broken into five parts. All five are in the playlist on the YouTube channel at Hope in Dark Times. Thanks again. Part 5 Questions and Answers. Question Is it inappropriate for me to describe myself as being born again in the present tense? Answer Absolutely not. In fact, the Apostle Peter wrote, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. 1 Peter 1.3 In this context, although we may use the term born again in the present tense, the main focus is on the hope we possess due to the resurrection of Christ from the dead. Speaking of things in the present tense, even when they are still in the future, is a common practice for God. This is because his promises are unwavering and infallible, making even the yet-to-be-received promises as certain as if they were already fulfilled. A good example of this is Abraham. Romans 4.17 tells us, As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations, in the presence of him whom he believed, God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. God told Abraham, I have made you the father of many nations. Present tense. However, at the time this promise was made, Abraham remained childless. Interestingly, Paul appears to associate the fulfillment of this promise to Abraham with the concept of resurrection. Abraham wouldn't witness the emergence of the nation he was designated as the father of during his lifetime. He would have to await resurrection. Nevertheless, God communicated this promise to him as if it had already come to pass. In a similar manner, we can boldly declare, I have been born again. Question. Jesus was called a life-giving spirit by Paul at 1 Corinthians 15.45. Didn't Jesus have a physical body? How can he have been a spirit if he were physical? Answer. Considerable confusion and ambiguity have persisted throughout the centuries regarding the distinction between the spiritual and the physical. Many people tend to automatically associate the word spirit or spiritual with an ethereal, immaterial, and disembodied essence. This misconception is primarily rooted in heathen philosophies and religions rather than biblical teachings. Although the Bible does indeed discuss spirits, the spirit of God, and the human spirit, its definition differs significantly from the popular misconception. For instance, the spirit of God, though invisible to us, can manifest itself through tangible changes in the material world, as seen in the resurrection of Jesus by the spirit of God, which is a hope for all believers, as stated in Romans 8.11. It can also indwell individuals and is often equated with God's mind or thoughts. This perspective is clearly illustrated in Paul's statement found in 1 Corinthians 2, 11 through 12. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person, which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. In this context, man's spirit, as well, is equated with his innermost mind or thoughts. This leads us to the concept of a spiritual body. While the Bible does mention this concept, some struggle to reconcile these two words. Paul employs the term spiritual body when referring to the transformation that occurred in Christ during his resurrection and the transformation we anticipate when Christ returns. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. 1 Corinthians 15.44 The crucial point for comprehension lies within the term spiritual body. Despite being spiritual in nature, it is still a corporeal body. Additional proof of Jesus possessing a physical body can be found in his own statements. 
Following his resurrection, when he abruptly appeared before his disciples, they were taken aback by the unexpected presence and initially believed they were seeing a ghost. In this situation, their concept of a spirit was evidently in line with the common contemporary understanding, referring to an immaterial and ethereal being. Nevertheless, Jesus dispelled their misconception by addressing them as recorded in Luke 24, 38 through 39. Why are you troubled, and why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. Did the Apostle Paul contradict Jesus then by describing Jesus as a life-giving spirit? Absolutely not. This is a matter of distinguishing between the non-biblical concept of spiritual beings and what the Bible actually teaches about them. For instance, the Bible refers to God as spirit, John 4.24, but it also portrays him as having a physical presence, as demonstrated in the account of Moses in Exodus 33.19-23. In that passage, God placed Moses in the cleft of a rock, passed by him, covered Moses' eyes with his hand, and allowed Moses to see his back once he had passed. Additionally, in Genesis, it is stated that God created Adam and Eve in the image of God, a concept that would be nonsensical if God were an intangible and incorporeal being. A comprehensive explanation of this topic is beyond the scope of a brief response. However, it can be summarized by stating that a spiritual body is synonymous with an immortal body a concept elucidated by the Apostle Paul in the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians. On the other hand, a non-spiritual body, also referred to as the natural body by Paul, is the body we currently possess. This natural body is mortal and subject to death. It deteriorates and decays because it relies solely on biological functions, and it is affected by the law of entropy that operates in the natural world. The solution to this degradation is to have a spiritual body that is not sustained by natural biological processes, but by the divine power of God. Question. Is water baptism necessary for salvation? Answer. In short, yes. Baptism in and of itself, however, does not provide the salvation. Instead, it's something that was commanded to be done by Jesus, was practiced by Jesus during his ministry, and was continued by his apostles. As water baptism was a command of Jesus, his words apply, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. John 14, 23 through 24. John the Baptist put it even more bluntly, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. John 3, 36.